What defines a nation? Its landmarks? Its people? culture. Taking you from the plains of the Serengeti to the busy streets of Shanghai, from the podium of renowned leaders to the workbench of undiscovered artisans, this is Portrait of a Nation. The Economist's cover story in July 2000 labeled it the hopeless continent. Yet less than 11 years later, the magazine made a U-turn, proclaiming it the hopeful continent. The IMF estimates that by 2015, seven of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world will be in Africa. There's no doubt that Africa is challenging the prevailing perception of failure, famine, and conflict. International investors have taken note, seizing on opportunities across the continent. One country in particular has been leading the pack, with a GDP growth rate that earned it the accolade of being the fastest growing economy in the world, Ghana. When the first Europeans arrived, getting to the end of the 15th century, they found so much gold, that is why it was named the Gold Coast. It was also the time of the discoveries, the great explorations. So as the Gold Coast was discovered, then you got to the Americas were also discovered. And they wanted to have plantations grow cotton, grow tobacco, grow sugar cane. And they discovered that the Africans they came to meet were very strong. So the Gold Coast became more or less like a slave coast. Ancient forts recall the latter centuries, an era of traders from Europe, a time of gold and slavery, a time of darkness. Emilia Castle was building. 1482 by the Portuguese to protect what they had discovered. It was the first fortification that was built for the trade. So along the coast were dotted quite a number of these fortifications where slaves were kept and shipped off to the Americas. One second past midnight, March the 6th, 1957. The moment has come. Here in West Africa, a nation is born. Ghana is free. Ghana was the first country in sub-Saharan Africa to gain independence, and it was great news for Ghana and the rest of Africa. Fortunately, we had a leader, Kwame Nkrumah, who had experienced a bit of racism in the Americas, who had lived in Britain before, and so who was quite passionate about the rights of Ghanaians to take care of themselves. He said, we prefer independence with danger than servitude in tranquility. The single most important event that has taken place in Ghana since independence is the discovery of oil. It was the systematic exploration and sustained exploration effort that led to the major discovery of the Jubilee Field in 2007. 
The discovery of oil in Ghana has tremendous opportunities in terms of um, job creation, not just in the oil sector, but in other industries. The challenges are many, but I know the oil now in Ghana is a blessing to our nation. Ghana has been presented with a new opportunity. What we need to do now is to be able to use the revenues that we're getting out of oil and gas to quickly transform this economy. It seems like a country that is, is ready to take off. And that's very encouraging, it's very energizing. They are no longer a low-income country. They're moving into the middle-income country ranks. Expectations of the population are growing and expectations for the international community are gonna grow. This newfound oil wealth is clearly going to be a bonanza in terms of resources available for continued development spending. The onus will be on the government to show that that money is spent well so that the population uh, feels that they're also gaining uh, from the natural wealth of the country. With middle income country status, with oil revenues, it is now clearly being able to tap into other sources of finance. But it's not without risks. One of the key challenges that we face as a nation is to avoid the resource case and the effects of Dutch disease. Well, some countries that have struck oil have wound up wasting a lot of the resources and actually the country turns out worse than they were before. A lot of countries have found that corruption gets a lot worse. Ghana is trying to learn from the mistakes of other countries and trying to use best practices. One aspect of the oil and gas development in Ghana that USAID is particularly pleased to see is that there seems to be a very open dialogue. At the time that Ghana found oil, it had pretty much the full range of institutions that are required to manage that oil properly. The Ghana National Petroleum Corporation was created to give a commercial national focus to the search for oil and gas and to improve the benefits that the nation would derive from that process. The Petroleum Revenue Management Act that was adopted in 2011 is, is very important in setting the, the governing uh, framework for the use of oil revenues. We recommended that about 5 to 20 percent should be set aside in a stabilization fund to cushion the economy from future shocks. And I'm happy to note that you know, 70 percent of revenues flowing from the sector have been committed to infrastructure and physical expenditure roads, you know, hospitals, you know, schools. And at the same time put some of the funds into a, a heritage fund uh, that will be used for future generations. We have also established a Petroleum Commission, which is a regulatory agency for the sector. So all the critical elements are there. I, I think we've, we've achieved a lot, but we have a long way to go and leadership and governance will make a real difference. The only way to acquire power legitimately in Ghana is to go through the ballot box. Ghana has a really terrific history of, uh, of democratic strengthening in recent years. Unlike anywhere else uh, uh, really on the continent, I'd argue that Ghana's democracy is stronger than even South Africa's. We must first recognize a fundamental truth that you have given life to in Ghana. Development depends on good governance. USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development, has been in Ghana for over 50 years. So we're working with the government of Ghana, civil society organizations for increased transparency, accountability, responsiveness of governance. The public is beginning to gain greater awareness of its ability to demand responsiveness from government, to demand accountability, to demand transparency. Things have changed, and it's changed for the better. Economic growth has been very strong in 2011, at, at about 13 and a half percent. That was partly a reflection of the start of the oil production in Ghana, but also very robust performance of the non-oil sector. Ghana is very rich in other minerals, gold, bauxite, 
manganese, diamonds and so on. The mining sector is actually very important in terms of Ghana's exports. About 60% of Ghana's exports now are from the mining sector. So that's double of what it was only five years ago. Notwithstanding the oil revenues that are now coming in, there will still be a large proportion of Ghanaian households and a large share of the economy dependent on agriculture. Barry Calibre is a Swiss-based company, number one chocolate producer in the world. Barry Calibre Ghana processes raw cocoa beans into semi-finished products. A scheme such as the Free Zone are available to offer to investors ample opportunity to also participate in the growth of Ghana. We decided to come to the Free Zones here in Tema because the Free Zone concept provides us with the very solid infrastructures, tax incentives, and it's also pretty well located close to the port of Tema. The ports handle 75 to 80% of the total national traffic and support a large number of sectors, like the minerals, the bauxite, manganese, then we have agricultural products, cocoa, pineapple, banana, mango exports, also the manufacturing industry, large volumes of imports and exports. We plan to expand the ports to meet the growing uh, national economic need. Our priority is Takrade port first because of its proximity to the oil fields. The port of Takrade is the connecting hub between activities on land and our oil rigs offshore. So it's very, very important. We plan to spend in the region of $1 billion and to reclaim over 100 hectares of land. In Tema, we also plan to create additional space we also need to provide deep water for bigger vessels. So there will be some kind of public-private uh, partnership in the development of these facilities. The biggest project, a landmark of the future, proposes a great dam and hydroelectric power station. President Kwame Kumar's vision was to electrify Ghana, and we are doing it. Lake Botha is the largest man-made lake in the world. We export electricity to Togo, Benin, La Côte d'Ivoire, and then very soon um, Burkina Faso. Currently, the energy uh, generation is about 2,000 megawatts. We believe that we can go up to about 5,000 megawatts by 2015-2020. Volta River Authority has a mix of expertise now. It started with hydro, we moved into thermal. Very soon, we are going to go into solar and wind. Technology, it's just driving. It's the engine that's driving everything. IBM really looked at the globe and see the mature markets and emerging markets and realized that the growth and opportunities were in the emerging markets. The development of local scale is what's going to sustain business and allow the growth that we expect. There is definitely a need to increase the IT skill pool and that's why IBM is taking a lead role in the skills development. Development of IT skill set was one of the main phenomena which happened in Ghana in the last two decades. IPMC was the pioneer IT training company which established IT training centers across the country. Everything I needed was there, programming, networking, security, internet. I got my certificates only last month, but I've been able to sign my first support contract yeah, with a construction firm, and I'm very proud about that. The IT revolution has come to Africa and countries like Ghana are leading. Ghana today is very different by the touch of a button. They are in New York or they are in Toronto, Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. 
eGANA is the, the whole concept of using computing ICT networks to deliver government's policies and government's work. So what we've done is build infrastructure so that government agencies don't just use computing for word processing, but they use interactive applications. The government's goal for Ghana is to see uh, ICT as the engine of growth, as a job creator, as an enabler. A lot of Ghanaians who have traveled outside to study are coming back and they are bringing their skills. The brain drain is actually reversed and slowed down completely. But with the brain gain that's happening now, it's a big advantage. Where I think there's going to be the magic is uh, companies from the developed world partnering with local companies. Being a local company is not enough. Being a competent local company is what ticks the boxes. It's a win-win situation. You learn from the local partner, the local partner learns from you. Cyrus um, offers training for current employees and also potential future employees. In terms of current employees, every single person on an annual basis has to attend either a technical leadership or managerial course, or something that will add value to that person. It's a function of educating, you know, the next generation. One of the key things for us is to make sure that we help to build up the service industry, that the industry there is run by Ghanaians. It's important that international companies come in to invest here and use as much as possible the local people and bring the skills up to date. Working with local suppliers is a very critical part of our business. We want to ensure that we build their capacity in areas where they are unable to meet the standards of the oil and gas industry. That will transform the country more so than the oil. Talo have helped us to revise our procedures and processes to meet international standards. There has been a lot of improvement in the skills of the people. There's been a lot of training and that has helped a lot in developing Ghana as a country. I think Ghanaians are very entrepreneurial. For me, I think uh, it was about to bring um, financial products and wealth to the doorstep of every Ghanaian. I returned from the US to Ghana in 1990 because I thought that um, Africa needed to be developed by Africans. And my friends in the US, I like them to know this is where the action is going to be for the next 50 years, over the next 100 years. We have quite a lot of our women, they come more enterprising, you know, they own factories, they are really doing business. I wanted to come back to Ghana and manufacture in Ghana, but I wanted to create employment for people here and, and help grow the fashion industry here in Ghana. As Ghana's booming now and Africa's booming, it will be good to be part of the growth and development here. Your business becomes your baby. It's like how you see your child grow. I was born an entrepreneur and it's something that is, that is in me. I started this business in somebody's living room with a plier, scissors, cutter, and a tray. But today, here we are. <laughs> At Elag Bay, we use the local recycled glass bags to make jewelry for the local markets and exports to the US and Japan. This is an order from 10,000 villages an American company, a fair trade, and not for profit. And they buy all over Africa. The African Women Entrepreneurship Program, AWEP, was initiated in 2010 by Mrs. Clinton to encourage more exports to the US. We are now more into the shea butter products because the shea butter is being processed from picking the nuts to the butter by women. USAID were giving technical assistance to the shea butter producers because they work with export ready companies. You've been charged to go and make sure every woman's life is touched. I have opened my own shop and I'm, do, I'm making my own money. If not because of me, I don't know how to do these things, but because of her, I know how to do something I can sell it and then get money to look after myself and my children. Today, everybody's realizing you need to trade to make money, you need to create value. 
Divine Chocolate's story really started back in 1993 with the liberalisation of the cocoa market in Ghana, which meant that cocoa farmers could set up a buying company and they could run it as a cooperative, so run by farmers for farmers. Java Cocoa is made up of organised farmers who share the same aspirations and have the same focus. They are working together so that at the end of the day they can share benefits from their produce. Its mission was to improve the lives of cocoa farmers, to help them um, improve their livelihoods and their communities by getting more of the value out of the cocoa that they were growing. And so Divine Chocolate then was incorporated and set up by the farmers because they wanted to get a share of the very valuable chocolate market in both the UK and in America. In a community, one person alone cannot do everything. So with the one system, they can be helping themselves with the group so that things can be done easier. They come together to solve their problems in times of need. Nobwa means working together, and together you can achieve more than you can when you work on your own. I think the most exciting sectors in Ghana are the services sectors. The tourism sector is starting to take off. You just look at the construction going on around the airport with the hotels. And if I actually, I took my 13 year old son for his first trip to Africa. And I thought back to my first time in Ghana, which was 15 years ago, and tourism infrastructure has completely changed. You're starting to see a kind of middle class, business class around Accra. Uh, it's starting to have that feel of a place that's happening and a place that people are coming to to do business. It's easy to do business because the infrastructure gives Wi-Fi, my 3G, my Blackberry, no problem. There are a lot of beautiful hotels being built now and I fell upon the Monticello. It's in a beautiful area in Accra. The food is great, the staff is friendly, so it couldn't be better for me. Ghana certainly is a place to visit. I believe the culture of Ghana is a rich and colourful culture and uh, the people in Ghana will make your visit extra special. Ghana is really the perfect place. It's safe, it's beautiful. You could see a lot and do a lot and really feel the African vibe. We just came from the Kanopi walkway. It was terrifying. <laughs> You can feel at home. The, the people are friendly. You can't feel safe. Then I need help and everybody comes and help you. The Ghanaian people is the most welcoming people that I've seen in West Africa. That's for sure. I believe the true indication of a country coming into its own is when it starts exporting its culture. Kente cloth is our heritage. It was worn by royals in the olden days, and it's a sacred material. The red hues, the greens, and the rich gold all represent something in our culture. There could be, for example, an African proverb, like the Adinkra, Sankofa, going back to your roots, that's what it means. Ghana has come so far as far as bringing together culture and uh, fashion forward trendiness and making it something that the world is actually looking at now. The fashion industry is growing. This is the first year that we're going to be having Ghana Fashion and Design Week and it's very, very exciting because we have an opportunity to show the world what Ghana has to offer. This is going to be the first time that Vogue Italia has actually partnered with a fashion week in Africa. Because fashion has become, Ghana fashion or African fashion has become mainstream, print has become more accepted globally. So for us, it's good because other people outside are accepting us for our print and using it in what they do. I went to Ghana to go volunteer for a month. And while I was there, I was walking down the beautiful lush streets with little shacks that sell gorgeous textile fabrics. And then another small structure next to them with a woman and a sewing machine just waiting for work. I worked with a particular seamstress to make a more American style bag. Once she made the first 
four or five bags I was just bringing home as gifts and the idea hit me. I thought that they could be sold on the market here so I commissioned the seamstress to make 50 bags, brought them all back and once I was in the States I sold them within two weeks. Working with Dela has changed my life completely because now I have a job on my own, I can look after my family, I can do whatever I like at any time. When I began Della, I purposely chose not to have it be a nonprofit. I wanted to prove that socially responsible business can be done and that Ghana was a valuable resource for commerce. We source all of our materials in Ghana. Now we have at least 15 people who are full-time employees working for us. The response in the United States has been amazing. We've been getting really great response from local boutiques and actually partnering with some larger stores that are really excited about not only our mission, but the products that we're bringing to the market. Apple is launching the first ever African or socially responsible products in their store. I'm happy to say that these products are Della products handmade by our team in Ghana. We are very excited about not only what we are now, but what we're building to become. Here at the uh, Night of Tribute of the 20th uh, Pan-African Film Festival. Um, I'm extremely happy to be here and, and uh, have my film, The Destiny of Lesser Animals, in competition uh, as a best first feature. It's my first feature. Uh, we did principal photography in, in Ghana. One of the things with this film was to try to restore the idea that you could both make successful film and film that could play on an international stage at festivals like this one. But I think we've got some fantastic actors down there and some beautiful stories that if Hollywood can tap into, will we'll become a box office. Ghana is a representation of the future of Africa. There are so many brilliant people here, people who are willing and open to change, people who want to bring this country to the forefront. I want people to know that there is more to Ghana than just Saka. Saka might have placed us you know, on the globe, but there is so much our culture, you know, our environment, our receptiveness, how we receive visitors. We are praying that our challenges will be, will be handled well, that uh, we have a blessed Ghana some years to come. We've got our groove back, and I think it's going to go all the way. I think we're going all the way this time around. It's going to be great. We have one country, and we are working towards making sure it becomes a great nation. Here we are. We are working at it. <laughs>